Let's install TAP, and at the latter parts of this video, I've got some tips that might make TAP easier for you, and in addition, I've got some thoughts based on my limited use. To build this, I decided to go ahead and get a kit, and I got a kit from KB3D. Uh, it comes with everything you see here. Uh, here's the MGN9 rail. Uh, it even comes uh, with the printed, pre-printed guide if you need to cut your own rail. Obviously, we won't need that. It's got the uh, circuit board based uh, optical sensor, and it comes, strangely enough, with both mounts, uh, one for the optical and one for without if you decide to go that route. And uh, maybe in the future, they might decide to not give you both. But here, close up, you can take a look and see the difference between the two. We're only going to be using the one, this one with the waves in it, we can eliminate. No need. The kit comes with the four needed magnets. Actually, uh, you only need two of the magnets, so it comes with extra. Here's the guide for the linear rail to take it off the rail. It comes with all the screws you could possibly need, and I'm really happy to say it comes with significant extras. Uh, it comes with the heat set inserts. It also, um, here are the pre-printed pre uh, mounts for tap. It's set up for an MGN 12 rail. Uh, many of you are aware I use an MGN 9, and so I posted the link to this. Here I've printed a, a new mount, and uh, this was provided for me by Solders, who I believe designed this. You can see here, these are exactly the same, pretty much except for the hole spacings. And uh, so I'm gonna put the 12 millimeter model away. I'm going with the nine. Uh, this is not normally recommended. Make sure you've got a really good high quality rail. And next, we're going to install a whole lot of heat set inserts. All this video is heavily chopped and speeded up, ideally to make this as quickly as possible. But I'm going to go quiet, believe it or not, and I'm not going to say much while we get through all of this. To insert the magnets, uh, put a drop of super glue in each of these, and it might be a little bit tight, excessively tight, but force the magnets in. Make sure you observe polarity, and you may need another tool like I do uh, to help protect your fingers, and uh, push down quite hard. Make sure these are seated. Uh, they're a little bit odd in that they may look like they're not flat in or not supposed to be flat, but they are supposed to be flat, but the edge surface surrounding it isn't. So just be warned. And then we're going to insert the mount for the optical switch. And there's two sets of screws that go through here. One, these set at 45 degree angle, and there's another set that'll go straight in. I'm just following the Voron tap guide here. I've done nothing different except for the mount for the MGN 9 rail. So by all means, please go ahead, follow the photos. And again, I'm speeding this up as quickly as possible to get through it because it's all in the manual. And uh, here are the screws that go straight through. These bolts are supposed to be tightened in um, almost all the way. Uh, we're supposed to leave about two and a half millimeters of spacing uh, between uh, the head of the bolt 
and uh, the base of the mount. And so here I've just uh, set my set screw on my micrometer. Uh, so it's at two and a half millimeters. And here I'm just measuring to make sure I get this as requested in the manual. Next, we need to mount the optical switch, and it's simply two screws again, just in the manual. Make sure you pay attention to the polarity of the wires here, because when you connect it later on to whatever you're going to be connecting it to, in my case, CAN bus, um, I was thrown a little bit in that I just assumed red and black were positive and negative, and it seems like the, uh, the blue and the black, um, for whatever reason, well, the black didn't seem to be negative. So anyway, just make sure you check that. And here we're inserting the flathead bolts. The magnets are gonna attach to these. Just make sure that these are um, flush mount with the surface. And uh, you probably want these to be pretty even um, because again, these are gonna be the only two things that are actually holding the print head in one place. Next come these two small button head screws. Uh, I've inserted them here and your print head's going to rest on these. I ended up removing them in the end. Next we're going to install the magnets and these are marked. Um, there's a little indentation, one of them with one and the other one with two. And uh, they are marked specifically to go on the right and left side. It turns out or at least I was not able to actually insert them incorrectly, even though they are marked. Uh, the one thing that did happen here is when I was assembling the second one of these magnets inserted and glued into the plastic, uh, it shot out from underneath my hands due to the pressure, flew off somewhere into the basement, and I could never find it ever again. Probably due to the magnet, it stuck somewhere to something. And so I'm only going to insert the one here, um, it'll simply slide in. Again, it doesn't slide in flat. It needs to slide in as an angle because it's going to mate with the flathead screws in the other half. And then just use one of these screws and washers as identified in the manual. And you don't have to insert these tightly. In fact, you probably should insert them loosely. But again, I'm only inserting one here. Please go ahead and insert both. You'll see later on in the video, I will be inserting the second one. And in fact, it'll be a different color. Next we'll want to install the carriage, uh, rather the rail for the carriage, and we need to take the carriage off the rail. Uh, this one happens to have protection internally, a little wire guide to attempt to keep the balls in, but it's still a little fragile, so I'm going to use the uh, pre-printed um, piece here and make sure you line it up with the groove as it exists on the rail and just line it up and you can push it in and it'll push the rail out while this will displace the rail and it will also keep uh, all your bearings or the ball bearings in place inside the carriage and here you can see pushing it along I probably don't need to remind you, but you should probably take this opportunity to grease the ball bearings within this carriage. Uh, it would be ideal to do that before you assemble the entire tap. And here we are with the rail free for insertion. To mount this, we use three different size screws. Again, the sizes are in the manual and uh, the largest actually gets a heat set inset insert threaded onto the bolt acting as a spacer. The smallest bolt here uh, goes to the right or rather to the top of this carriage and right next to this tab, which is uh, the light break for the light switch. And then the medium bolt goes in the center Then the largest bolt with the heat set insert attached all the way 
to the bottom, or in this case, the right. When you do tighten that smallest screw, make sure the nut on the back is all the way in. In this case, you see it's not. I actually needed to use a longer screw to try and pull the nut in because it was a tight fit on my print. And, um, and then I unscrewed that screw and then put the short screw that's supposed to be there in there once this nut was seated correctly. But anyway, just something to watch out for. To grease the linear guide, I temporarily installed it onto the rail, and I used the technique I normally do with my high winds, which is using a hypodermic needle filled with um, the EP2 grease. And in this case, uh, I did have to use a smaller needle in the grease hole uh, than I normally would with my high winds, which are essentially the same size. And this is normally what I do to get the grease in. And I don't know if the needle was too small, the grease didn't come out with enough pressure, um, or maybe I just wasn't patient. And because the needle was small, I had to spend a lot more time on it. But I just could not see any real grease making it to the ball bearings. Um, and again, I tried this multiple times. And I know this looks a little dangerous here because I don't have the plastic um, bearing holder in here. Um, but it turns out, and it, you can't really see it in this photo, there actually is a piece of wire that's holding the ball bearings in. Um, you just can't see it in this video. Still, um, just fair warning, the balls still come out super easily. Um, I ended up using the hypodermic needle and applied the grease directly to the balls, and there is enough um, adhesion, adhesion of the grease to the ball to the needle where you can actually pull the balls out with simply grease. <laughs> and so I had to insert some of these back in. This was a little bit trickier than I thought it would be, um, but... I couldn't get this method to work like I use everywhere else. And so, again, I ended up applying the grease directly to the ball bearings inside, inserting it onto the rail, moving it back and forth to make sure the balls will rotate through internally until most of the grease seemed to be gone. And I just kept doing this until um, it seemed like this was thoroughly greased. With all that out of the way, let's install it. Make sure these get loosened up full, fully, meaning uh, this little white piece here should be all the way toward the back of the printer as far as it'll go. You need to do it to both sides. And then we simply mount the new carriage with the nine millimeter rail uh, onto the linear rail. Notice here I've added my X end stop switch you only need to do this if you're doing umbilical, which I am. If you're using the standard cable chains, uh, you don't need to do this. You could use the standard XY um, end stop switch pod. And uh, But here I've got the four bolts in, and I'm simply um, first making sure they thread all the way through because they're actually quite short, and they don't go into the... Um, carriage very deep and they shouldn't um, or you'll damage the carriage and you shouldn't over tighten these into the linear rail carriage either just so it's firm there's no play there's nothing loose and that should be it if you over tighten these they'll actually flex the outside of the carriage on the linear rail and actually have more front to back play um, which i've well which is a problem with rails in general. And since the belts are loose, um, mounting it is a little easier if you insert the belts in through the back now um, before tightening it down. And um, do this for all sides. It gets a little bit tricky. Again, um, make sure the belts are fully loosened. And you will need to, or you should count these. Um, these should be equal from top to bottom and from side to side. 
and uh, once you've got that worked out you can then go ahead and um, bolt this down but making sure these are perfectly even in terms of either the number of ridges or the number of um, the number of teeth in the belt or the spaces between the belt making sure these are equal now will make deracking just absolutely simple With the tool head carriage installed, we can now install the 9mm linear carriage. And using that insert, simply line it up and slide it on. And give it a little check. Uh, assuming it's a Z1 rail, it'll be a little rough, a little stiff, but that's okay. Next, we have the front side here. The screws that bolt into the carriage are really, really small, and it makes it really hard to align if it's a tight fit. So all I'm doing here is I'm taking out the top two and temporarily putting longer screws in, and that'll help me align up with the actual linear rail carriage um, because I can start to screw this in and then get everything aligned perfectly in terms of um, positioning of the holes on the carriage. And then I can start to tighten down the bolts, at least the shorter ones. And then once I have those done, I can take out these longer ones and then replace them with short ones. Again, this is only for alignment purposes. Please don't torque down these long bolts. You'll destroy your carriage or your linear guide carriage. Once that's complete, on the side here, I inserted a tie wrap. And again, in my case, because I have the uh, X end up stop switch mounted on this carriage, that allow me to tighten it down and keep it out of the way of the belts. In addition, the folded over belts here, um, this is the opportunity now to take those and put those into the belt holder right here as well. With all that done, go ahead and install uh, or reconnect the rest of your stealth burner. Um, again, the main carriage that mounted it to uh, the X-Rail is gone, um, which is kind of nice. Um, and so does whatever sensor, whether it be inductive, Euclid, whatever the case may be. Um, and everything else just attaches right on top of uh, that front plate that we added just about a minute ago. And uh, everything should bolt in. Make sure you run the wires um, correctly. In my case, I'm using CAN bus, so I'm just gonna reconnect them. Um, of course, if you're using a standard harness, use that. And you just connect the optical sensor to the same place where your previous sensor was. Once you've got everything connected, if you take a look around the back, you should see an LED light up. Uh, this lets you know that the sensor is powered, your electrical connection is okay, and if you want to, give it a little up and down push here, and you should see it turn off. If not, we may need a little bit of adjustment, and that's this is how you do that. You've got these two screws, one on each side, that are holding the magnets. Uh, what you need to do to get this started here is loosen these. Don't take out the screw. Leave it inserted but loosen them and then and then move the entire printhead up and down about five, six times. You should see the magnets move along with it. Um, this is just making sure you've got the full range of motion and that uh, the printhead um, on the carriage has actually hit bottom. And then go ahead and tighten these screws on both sides of the carriage to lock the magnets in the bottom most position and make sure they're aligned. So now we configure the software, basically our printer.cfg. I start by going off to the GitHub for a tap. And if you take a look, there's a directory called config, which gives you specific steps on how to update your clipper.cfg file. And to start, uh, we need to update the Z end stop. And we do that by taking a look at uh, the instructions right here, which is um, stepper underscore Z block, where we're gonna make the changes and put the virtual end stop in. 
So simply enter your printer.cfg file. And something that's not in the instructions is uh, notice here that normally I would have a Euclid.cfg include and an auto Z for the auto calibration, automatic Z calibration. Um, if you have Clicky or Euclid, uh, or if you're using automatic Z calibration, you'll have to comment those includes out um, because we're not going to be using those. Obviously, we're going to be using tap. And then uh, scroll down to the stepper Z section and notice here where it says uh, end stop pin. I've commented my old end stop pin out and I've created a new line for end stop pin and it's probe colon z underscore virtual underscore end stop. Uh, to explain to Clipper, we're going to be using tap. Uh, we're not going to use the end stop uh, that is we'd normally be using. Um, there's no mechanical switch anymore, at least traditional mechanical switch. We're going with the optical switch. Then go to the bottom of the file. The instructions state that you should remove any automatically saved end stop values. I'm not sure what an end stop value is, uh, but I did experience issues in the past when my Z offset was saved. And uh, every once in a while, I'd try to create a new one and I had a hard time saving it. And so here at the bottom where you have the pound asterisk pound, if you have a Z end stop, um, excuse me, not a Z end stop, a Z offset value, it would probably be all right to delete this. But just remember you did in case you run into some trouble later. Um, I deleted it because we're going to be setting a new Z offset anyway, and I want to make sure it overwrites this correctly and cleanly. And so um, I'm not showing you how I actually did it here, but you can see where it says Z offset. Just I would remove it. The GitHub tap instructions, uh, step two, is then to update your Z homing position by checking your safe Z home, um, or if you have a homing override setup. I don't have a homing override setup, but still, I will be doing this safe Z home. And again, go back to the printer.cfg file. And here's the safe Z home section. And if you take a look, um, I have commented out already, but there was a home X, Y position that wasn't the center of the bed. Uh, it was actually where the Z end stop location was. We're not using the Z end stop anymore. So here we're replacing home X, Y position. I have a 350 by 350 um, bed on my Voron. So I chose roughly half that or almost exactly half that. And so my new home X, Y position is 175, 175. So the next step in the directions are to update the probe's offsets. And so um, the probe X offset and Y offset uh, should go to zero. And then uh, of course we'll calibrate that later with the probe calibrate command. So here I've gone to the probe section and you can see the X and Y offset values. Uh, I went in and set these to zero and I actually commented out the Z offset either. Uh, I used to have a value here. I don't really see the point of it anymore. And especially because uh, it's going to be setting a Z offset when we calibrate anyway. And so I just commented that out. The next step in the instructions have us copy this uh, activate G code section and simply hit copy um, or you can select all and do a control or a command C depending on the operating system that you're using. And then we go over, you can see here in the probe section, I just pasted it at the end of the probe section. And as all this code is going to do is it's going to check and see if the temperature uh, is um, over 150 degrees. It'll give us a warning and it won't allow us to use tap. And uh, there's good reason to do this because it will uh, damage your bed because the PEI sheet, as it gets hotter, it becomes softer. So then click Save and Restart. 
and then go to the tool head control panel on fluid and mainsail and then uh, use the controls to move the print head roughly speaking to the center of the bed or someplace you're comfortable with and then move on down here to the council and enter in um, probe accuracy um, f samples equals 10 let's say for starters and hit enter and let it run and let us get past i as you can see i actually ran this before as well and um, you should see that test run and you should see a series of values the first one the values probably aren't going to be very stable um, it's the very first time tap is running and you may find yourself needing to do this multiple times until it starts to stabilize um, here you can see a standard deviation of 0 0.006, which is, I, I guess, okay. But if you try it a few more times, you can probably get um, 0 0.001 or better. And so do it a few more times until it looks like things have stabilized. And then you'll want to go to the Voron startup documentation. And depending on your printer, run through the Z offset adjustment. You'll want to run the Z and stop calibrate um, or the probe calibrate, depending on which model you've got. And then once that's done, um, of course, this will be doing the paper test. And once you're happy with the results of your paper test, hit accept and then save config just as it's outlined here in the directions. So I've only been using TAP for a short while here, but here's some tips that I picked up along the way. Um, one of them is when you go into your printer.cfg file, you'll want to probably make some changes to your G32 macro. And um, here in my macro, you can see where I've added to the top as soon as I run it, uh, turn on the case light, turn on the Nevermore fan. Uh, if you're using the LED lighting, you'll probably want to set status heating, um, which you can see right here. Uh, but the important pieces here is this um, M190 um, and S90. And what this is going to do is tell the bed to start heating whatever temperature you have after the S. I have it 90. I'm actually going to drop it to 80. And um, the printer or this G32 macro is going to wait until it hits that temperature. Then it'll run the M109 and set the hot end to 150 degrees, which is the maximum that tap will tolerate based on the macro we pasted in the file before. And so basically when you start up your printer um, is all you got to do when you enter in G32, it'll automatically heat up to the maximum temperature, the bed temp and the nozzle temp. That uh, is good for tap. The second tip is also a macro change. And if you go into your print end macro, your G code macro, um, if you take a look um, under the G90, I've added a clean nozzle. So basically, if you have a nozzle brush, the idea here is turn off the heaters, immediately go back to the printer, clean off the nozzle to get any gunk um, off it. And so ideally, when you start your next print quad gantry level or whatever the case may be, you've got a clean nozzle. My apologies, but tip three is completely obvious. I've seen in multiple places online where people recommend uh, that you run the calibrate for your nozzle about a hundred times to break it in. I actually did do that and I recommend it as well. It's not a bad idea. However, I see everyone run it in the center of the bed. I highly recommend you jog your print head over to the farthest corner or an area that you're not going to use and then go ahead and do this. I don't normally see any visible damage as long as this is done at cold temperatures or as long as the hot end is under 150 degrees. Um, but trust me, <laughs> I've run it once at over 150 degree, degrees on an old scratch bed that I use, uh, especially for something like this. And uh, it, um, it certainly made a mess. So 
just go ahead and be careful. So part five, the pros and cons of TAP. I'm sure you've heard many of these already, um, but some of the concerns that I guess appear in my mind is it probes a cool bed and nozzle. It can't do it hot because it damages the bed. If you have concerns about accuracy, absolute accuracy at temperature, this might be an issue, although I haven't seen any so far in practicality. MGN 12 is only supported, and my assumption is because many MGN 9 rails may not be able to handle the load and accurately measure, but I was able to do it here with an MGN 9. There's also um, smooth PEI issues in that it's not recommended. Here you can take a look. I tried it just because I wanted to. This is my sacrificial bed plate here. And this was done at printing temperature and it immediately punched a hole through the PEI. And although it's small, it's kind of severe. And so you're not gonna be doing this at temperature and they don't recommend you use smooth PEI either. So you're gonna kind of gonna be stuck using a uh, rough PEI, which isn't what I always want to use. Uh, and then there's weight and the impact of acceleration. Um, here, take a look. This is the weight of the standard um, carriage with all the bolts and everything else. Uh, mine measures out to uh, about 54 grams and it's reasonably lightweight. And here you can see on my LZ, uh, I'm accelerating around 5,600 and on MZV, which is what most people use, 4,300. And then from there, it drops, of course, or, you know, it depends. But taking a look here at TAP, it's 96 grams. So it's essentially twice the weight of the carriage. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of mass. And when you take a look, I can't explain this, but at ZV, my acceleration was 6,600. It went up although I see ringing all over the place. If you look at MZV, what you'd normally be using, 1,900. Um, that's like a 50% drop. That's really quite substantial. So if you're concerned about speed, I don't think it's for you. As far as benefits, um, there are some. It's more accurate, really an order of magnitude more accurate. Is it important though? In day-to-day -day operations, no, I don't think so. You know, I'm not really seeing any benefit in terms of accuracy. Whatever I was using before was accurate enough. It eliminates the ZN stop. Um, I'm not convinced the ZN stop ever really fit perfectly well. Um, and it also has those mechanical micro switches where oftentimes after a while in the heat, they start to break down. And then the Z probe, um, you know, if you're using induction, I've never found them reasonably accurate. If you're using something else, it works well, in fact, really well, although I found myself having to replace micro switches multiple times. And again, I think it's because of the heat. Uh, most of the micro switches we use are not really rated for those high temperatures. And it doesn't seem like TAP has an issue here. It's an optical sensor, which has no problem and the rest is mechanical. Supposedly it comes with crash protection. Uh, if the nozzle hits the bed, it'll stop. I don't know. I haven't encountered this yet. I, um, you know, maybe over time we'll see, but this isn't something that really I've noticed. In short, um, if you use AutoZ today um, and AutoZ calibration, and you're using something like Clicky or you're using Euclid, you know, I don't think there's any noticeable improvement except a little bit of a less, um, I guess, dance at the beginning of your print. Your print can start a little sooner. But whatever little bit of additional accuracy you get really doesn't show up, you know, in terms of day to day. Um, and then there's the acceleration piece. I think for most people, other than the one strange situation I encountered, which I'm still trying to get to the bottom of, that's a pretty big hit. And um, if you really are worried about speed or rather acceleration, I'm not sure this is for you. However, if you're still using the induction probe and pretty much stock, I think TAP for the most part is a no-brainer. Um, but if 
you want to measure temperatures um, at high temperatures if you're worried about that. Um, if you want to use smooth PEI and if you're worried about acceleration, I don't know. Um, Clicky or Euclid with auto Z calibration actually works really, really quite well. And um, it doesn't quite have that weight impact. And so I think you probably have to think a little harder about do you want to really make this change or not. That said, I'm happy with TAP. Um, it's, it's working well. Um, I still have a few acceleration issues to work out, but uh, I think I'm going to keep it at least for a while. And um, in that case, if you found this video useful, please subscribe and thank you for watching.